Hello patrons and welcome to our special bonus episode. It is just me, Nathan, here today. Uh, the reason that's the case is because we've been having a little bit of difficulty getting some recording done the past month. Uh, so in order to stay on schedule with the main show, I'm just going to be recording the Patreon episode today. And for this episode, we're going to be doing a story time with Nathan, as you probably guessed by the title of the episode. We did one of these about a year ago when we found ourselves in a similar situation, and I really enjoyed it, and I know some of you did too, so we're going to do it again. In case you didn't listen to that one, uh, this is not going to have any improv in it, but it's just going to be me reading some of the short stories that I've written about the world of Palladium, uh, because I love world building and, and writing stories, and so I've got quite a collection of little tales that help uh, share some world building that just expands some characters that we maybe have seen before. Uh, and I think are just a lot of fun. So we've got quite a range of stories, some really short ones, are just a little poem, uh, some a little longer, some of them related to Rage of the Sea, some Song of the Hero, some related to the original Night's Quest from, from our book club episodes. So we've got a huge spectrum. So we're going to be starting with the least spoilery ones. For example, people who just listen to Rage of the Sea, we'll start with those, and then uh, we're going to get more spoilery as we go along. So I'll let, explain each story when we get to them, and what you maybe need to have listened to beforehand, but don't worry, uh, this is going to be a very chill episode, very fun episode, so get yourself a nice cozy blanket, warm beverage, get snug as we dive into some stories from the world of Palladium. This first story is very much a Rage of the Sea story. Uh, it was something that I wrote um, while we were wrapping up Song of the Hero, and I knew we were going to be talking about Brodrings and Tanin, but I wanted to explore that more. I wanted to uh, develop those ideas a little bit more, so I, I wrote this story as a way of just kind of playing around with the setting so I could be ready by the time we actually recorded this story. So uh, this story is called Tanin, Kings of the Raging Sea, A Selection. Written by Gondril Swan in 612. It's written by me, but that's the character who wrote it. The Raging Sea is no safe place. Aye, I've seen it myself. I've ridden its waves and survived its storms, and I've seen what lurks below. The great monsters who live in these waters have caused much fear to those of us who call the land our home. These powerful creatures are called Tanin and you have every right to be afraid. They can swallow whole ships, they loom over islands, and storms emulate from their presence. But there are those who do not fear the Tanin, the brodrings of the sea. These fierce sailors have learned to not only slay these creatures, but how to control them. No great captain can be found without a mighty Tanin. This is what has allowed them to have such a great presence along the coast and in the deep. Yet even though they know so much about Tanin, there's still so much mystery. Where do the Tanin come from? Do they reproduce? Why are no Tanin the same? What can we learn from them? These questions and more are the reason why I set out on my journey. I, Gondril Swan, High Elf of Cormoria, son of a scribe, have set out to learn everything I can about the Tanin. These are my findings. I know many will find my works to be facetious, riddled with fable and rumor, but I must assure that these are either first-hand accounts or taken from credible sources. Not to dwell on the reliability of my work too long, but I shall share my story in brevity. I set out to the Raging Sea from Salak, the Phoenix City, I paid my way aboard a brodring ship. It was there that I met my first Tanin. Large, scaly, fierce of eyes, strength in grip and claw. Its tooth was taller than I, and then some. I will not lie, I soiled myself when it first stared at me. The brodring orc captain, Corm Wavecutter, was kind to me. He taught me all he knew and got me started on my journey. I stayed with this crew for a good five years. Afterwards, I hopped from ship to ship, island to island, encountering as many Tanin as possible. Out of my records, over half were first-hand encounters. The others come from stories or pictures. I have marked the distinction in my notes for transparency. I have not included Tanin told to me by tail spinners and bards. The stories are always exaggerated and are better in song than in study. 
What makes a Tanin? As far as I know, no one has made a distinct list of qualities and characteristics. Though, to be fair, there is not really a need for one. You know when you see one. It should also be noted that finding shared qualities is a difficult task, as the variety of Tanin is grand. But I have attempted this task nonetheless. 1. Tanin live in the raging sea. An obvious observation, but important. There have been no reported sightings on the eastern and western seas. Why this is the case is another one of my mysteries. They can also not venture onto land, even the ones that look like they should be able to physically do so. They are bound to the water. 2. Tanin are grand in size. The smallest I've seen was the size of a ship. The largest crested the clouds like a mountain. It was awesome in the literal sense of the word. 3. Tanin are hunters and fighters by nature. Once they have been tamed, this nature becomes subdued. But in the wild, there are no peaceful, docile, or friendly Tanin. They seek to devour anything living. They will fight any other Tanin they encounter. They are a grave danger to anyone but the most experienced of Brodrin captains. 4. No two Tanin are the same. Each one is completely unique. Of course, people claim to have similar or of like type Tanin, but these are either exaggerations, lies, or metaphors. From here onward, I shall describe each Tanin that I encountered. Its physical appearance, its behavior, its size, and whether it was tamed or not. This catalog was helpful for me to begin to understand the core of Tanin. Longfang. I saw him on the horizon first. A small island, I thought, covered with dry grasses. It would be a good spot to stop and walk on ground again. But then it rose. Straight up it climbed, with no splashing or fumbling around, just up. Its body was coated in long brown fur, matted by the salty water, like a lion's mane but unkempt and drenched. Then I saw its eye, or its eyes, rather. The three orbs shaped like a triangle glowed like green suns. Beneath them was a nose, again not unlike a lion. By this point, the top of its head had already cleared our mizzenmast. But the rising did not stop. Below the nose came the most terrifying part. The teeth. There were so many. I counted a hundred before I lost count. Each tooth was the length of a sword wide. There were layers of these teeth, at least four deep. As the tanin rose, the length of the teeth continued. Surely there had to be an end. The wall of teeth reminded me of baleen, but far more deadly. The teeth did end eventually, but not before rising another length of the mast. <laughs> I could then see inside its maw as the sea poured out like a waterfall. The darkness within could have been eternal. I believe no light would have been able to shine inside. It drew me in. Thankfully, I am not responsible for any of the ship's tasks when a Tanin is spotted, for I would have been of no use. Water cascaded and dripped off the Tanin's mane, creating a mist upon the ship. How this Tanin swam about, I do not know. What the rest of its body was like, I, I cannot say. For it was at this time that our Tanin, Serentra, engaged the Long Fang. The battle was quick, as Serentra was well trained. I wish I had the courage at this time to move, to, to look over the edge and peer into the deep, alas. This was still early on in my journey, and I had not yet developed a resistance to Tanin. So, that's the end of that story. As you can see, this was uh, me having fun, just playing around with what Tanin could look like, what it would be like to see a Tanin for the first time. And so, I am excited for Enrage of the Sea for us to meet even more Tanin. Uh, maybe we'll even meet Longfang in, in our journeys. Who's to say? Uh, let me know if you want that giant of a hairy creature to, to pop up in, for the Kaiserion. All right, this next story is a little poem. Uh, so I need to explain a little bit because this poem is 
simultaneously doesn't reveal anything and also is one of the bigger lore-ish drops we've ever had. So all of our stories have been from the world of Palladum, right? That's where Glenwood is, the Raging Sea, Tereve, really, and right. All these places are, are on this world. Uh, but I have other worlds, you know, think of them maybe like other planets or like little, little other dimensions, maybe. Planets is probably a better analogy. That all exist in the same universe as Palladum. And we have not talked about those. We've not gotten to those. We've not done anything about them yet. I want to. Uh, so I am saying this so you can be curious and, and <laughs> maybe want more of that. But this is a little poem describing one of those other worlds. It's called The Faces of Van Hall. Upon the world of Van Hall lies many cliff and mount, their peaks caressing heaven, their valleys hugging shore. None living on Van Hall can dare to live without life that is within them through their stone and ore. And while the mounts of Van Hall are there in every view, there is no land without them, these pillars fill all space. None living on Van Hall can find out what they do, how they came to be here, and why they have a face. Upon the mounts of Van Hall are faces of old days. Carved within the gray stone is judgment looking down. None living on Van Hall knows of their ancient ways, older than the cities and larger than your town. Below the face of Van Hall are bodies built for kings, colossal arms they're wielding, their shelter in their feet. None living on Van Hall knows what their praises sing. The makers of these faces they shall never get to meet. About the face in Van Hall, questions have been born. Who has built these giants, and with what mighty tool? None living on Van Hall could make the mountains torn. Some have claimed they know how, but they are just a fool. Within the face of Van Hall, secrets have been kept. Songs are sung about them, but they are just a guess. None living on Van Hall knows how long they've slept, what had made them slumber, or what will end their rest. So yeah, that's a little poem about the world of Van Hall, which is not the world of Plato. How many worlds are there? When will we see them? What are they about? How are they connected? Ooh, sorry. Time for the next story. This next story will probably be the longest one of this story time with Nathan. In the last story time with Nathan, I mentioned that I took a fiction writing class in my last semester of college, and of course I used that opportunity to flesh out uh, the world of Knight's Quest and Palladium. Um, and so this is one of those stories that I wrote near the end of the class. So it's one of my, I don't know, I don't want to say better ones, but one of the bigger ones because it was near the end of the class. Now, Keep in mind that at the time that I wrote this, we had not yet started recording the podcast Night's Quest. So the only Night's Quest I had in my mind was the original story that we read in our book club episodes that are on the Song of the Hero podcast right now. Now, you don't need to have listened to those in order to understand this story. Again, I had to write this story for a class, so it had to be completely standalone. But it does flesh out uh, some of the characters from uh, the book club episodes. Now... The canonness of this story, and of course the book club story, are at the moment canon, but I do want to eventually at some point rewrite that story as like a real book someday, um, and so that will probably rewrite the canon. But for now, this is canon, this is real, this happens in the world of Playdome, though it happens way, way later than uh, Rainer and his friends, you know, hundreds of years afterwards, so yeah, uh, and just a little content warning, There's, this one's pretty violent. I think there is a swear word in this one. Um, and there is uh, references to abuse. So if that's uh, something you don't want to listen to, then you might want to skip ahead to the next story. Here is the story. It's called Angel of Death. Tonight, I deal out justice. We emerge from the forest and face the castle wall. I can't see over it. I look for the way up that we used last time. To the left, there is a crawling vine that reaches to the top. Motioning to Joel to follow me, I place my leather boot on the vine to test its strength. It will hold. I brush my long blonde hair from my face and begin to climb. 
The dagger on my belt sways and hits my leg as I pull myself up the castle. Soon, I hear Joel start climbing below me. His breath is heavy and panting. <laughs> Typical. His breathing will give us away the moment a guard walks by. As I climb, I run through our plan. Get over the wall. Go to the councilman's room. Interrogate him. Kill him. Escape the castle. Simple. I straddle over the battlements and look around. I'm standing on the ramparts that run around the castle. I see a tower to my left and the keep in front of me. The councilman's bedchamber is in there. I hear Joel stretch over the wall and land on the ramparts. You'll need to be more careful if we're going to succeed, I whisper to him, continuing to scout the area. Every noise echoes in this castle. Yeah, yeah, I'll be more careful. Joel stands up and dusts himself off. You know, Paige, I think you're being too uptight about this. No one knows we're here. Most of the guards are gone for a hunting party, and Councilman Reyna is sleeping. These are our advantages, so let's try not to lose them. I look at the courtyard below, searching for movement. A guard appears from the south door, escorting a noble in purple. I duck beneath the battlements, dragging Joel with me. What is it? Shh! I silence him. I listen to the footsteps below, the fall leaves crunching beneath their boots, the jingling of his chainmail. I feel my heart rate climb. I grab the angel necklace in my pocket. The chain wraps around my fingers, and its cold metal wings help me slow down my breathing. After sitting low for a minute, the noise passes, and I peer over the battlements. The courtyard is clear. All right, let's get going. I leap over the wall and land silently with a roll. I turn to see Joel land less gracefully. I told you to be careful. So what? If he finds us, we'll just kill him. He draws his dagger and smiles. He's an idiot. No, we only kill the guilty. Otherwise, we are nothing but criminals. But we are criminals. We just snuck into the king's castle. Besides... You have yet to tell me what crime Councilman Reyna has done. Reyna's face flashed across my mind, his smug grin underneath his dark mustache, his hand on my wrist. I shake my head to focus. He's done plenty, but you don't need to worry about that. Just stop making so much noise. Joel put his dagger back inside. We snuck over to the keep's door, and Joel started picking the lock. Since he had worked with this lock last time we were here, it would only be a moment before we were in. Joel had almost blown our cover last time. He had decided to take some golden goblets. I agreed to let him claim some loot as payment for his help with the locks. However, these goblets clanged and chimed in his sackcloth sack all the way out. That fool attracted quite a following. I'll kill him if he causes us to fail. The lock clicks. The wooden door creaks open. Joel puts his pick away and smiles smugly. I roll my eyes. It's moments like these where I wish I had learned how to pick locks. We slide in and close the door behind us. The inside of the keep is dark, and it takes me a moment to adjust my eyes. Only a few candles are lit, revealing the red carpet and ancient tapestries. We creep down the hall, using the carpet to pad our steps. Up the stairs... Three doors to the left, we find Reyna's bedchamber. When we were here last week, Reyna was in the council room for a meeting. We had used the time to scout out his room. I close my eyes and picture what's behind the door. It is a rectangular room. The door is on the shorter side, and a window is opposite the door, draped in thin curtains. A dresser stands on the left wall, three candles and a small chest sat on top. In the far right corner is the bed. It's large and padded. The blanket, made of thick furs, and the pillow, stuffed with goose down, show how well Reyna has been compensated. A map of the kingdom hung on the wall, right of the door. A large chest sat beneath it. I open my eyes, and nod to Joel. He picks the lock with ease, slowly pushes open the door, and we both creep inside. The window is open. A cold draft blows in, fluttering the drapes. Joel points to the bed, 
where I see a figure underneath the furs. I nod and sneak over to Reyna, placing each step with caution. I draw my dagger, the dagger he used to own. <laughs> the irony of this situation will probably not be noticed by Reyna when I put it next to his throat. Maybe I'll finally be able to learn where she is. Maybe today I can get some real answers. I stand right above him, my breath held, ready to make my move. Then I hear a thud. I turn and see the small chest on the floor, its contents spilled on the stone. Joel is standing with his sack, jewelry in hand. Oops, he whispers. A hand grabs my wrist in an all-too-familiar manner. I look back to see Reyna reaching up from his bed. So, you're the ones who stole from me last week. He pulls out his sword that was underneath the furs. It was foolish of you to return. Time slows as I analyze the situation. Reyna is sitting up in bed, holding onto my right arm, which is holding my dagger. Joel is behind me, staring dumbly at the rings and necklaces he spilled. The window is open, breeze flowing past the drapes. I could escape through the window and leave Joel behind. No, I, I couldn't leave someone again. I could attack now and lose my chance for information. Then I'd have nothing. I could break free from his hold, dive back, and prepare for an assault. I weigh the options and decide to go with the ladder. I roll backwards over the golden trinkets. The jewelry slides around, dancing and clinging. I quickly stand and place my feet firmly. I put my hand on my pocket. The angel necklace is still there. I turn to Joel and expect him to be braced for attack as well, but I am surprised when I see him charging forward. He charges at Reyna, dagger drawn and fist high in preemptive triumph. I reach out to stop him, but I am too late. When he reaches the bed, Reyna is already standing. I see the sword travel through Joel's stomach before I can call out to him. That bastard has done it again. Reyna's haunting grin returns. A strange man stands in the doorway to my home, grinning. He's preventing us from getting inside. The summer sun was starting to set across the field. I had just returned from town with my older sister, Erin. I had never seen this man before. Good afternoon, girls, he says, bowing slightly. Is this your home? Uh, yes, Erin says, not letting go of my hand. Uh, who are you? Uh, are you a friend of father? I'm Reyna, and... Yes, you could, you could say that. We used to, uh, work together, in a way. But not anymore. I see him slide his dagger back into his belt. It's getting late, and you two need someone to protect you. Uh, we are protected, Aaron says, standing tall. Mother and father do that. Oh, I'm afraid they won't be able to help anymore. Or do much of anything, for that matter. He grins, revealing his crooked teeth. As he grinned, it made his mustache look like it had grown, like a creeping vine across his upper lip. I felt my gut wrench, and I wanted to run. I wanted to get away from this man and to go and get help, but where would I go? The nearest settlement was a few miles away, and if I found a stranger on the road, who would believe a kid like me? I looked around for anything to help. An oak tree, a wagon, a shovel, a chicken, nothing of use. Then he grabs me. His hold is firm and tight. Come now, he says. Let's get you to somewhere safe. I'm transfixed by Joel's blood dripping from Reyna's sword. His body is slumped on the floor. Reyna looks at me, squints his eyes, and laughs. <laughs> well, I'll be. Is that you, Paige? My, how you've grown. I say nothing. My breath quickens and my fist clenches. Were you trying to rob from me? He bends over and picks up a ring to analyze. That doesn't seem like you. <laughs> I raised you better than that. Where is she? I say through my teeth. I thought I would see you again, but I didn't think it would be so soon. He wipes his sword against Joel's chest. Where is Aaron? Your sister? I have no idea. 
He walks over to the window. I sold her to some Peruvian slaver a few years ago. He paid good money for her. <laughs> D to be honest, I was surprised he paid so much, considering how thin and beaten she was. I feel my face turn red as I bite my tongue. The dagger turns in my hand. The king will come back from his hunting party soon, and you will be trapped with me. Again. He strokes the drapes. It will be nice to have you around again. You'll pay for what you did to me and my family. Oh, is that what this is? Your way of dealing out justice? Of stopping the criminal? He laughs. <laughs> you were always so logical, Paige. But this doesn't make sense. You'll never be able to redeem yourself from your crimes. What, what are you talking about? I take a step back. Do you think I haven't been keeping tabs on you? You're not the only one who can spy on someone. I know that you joined the Assassin's Guild and have been doing their bidding. Is that where you found this buffoon? He kicks Joel's corpse. I'm not surprised. That part makes sense. Since I was the head of the Thieves' Guild, you obviously had to join my group's arc rival. <laughs> it was predictable, almost. No. What I find interesting is that you think you can be the good guy now. The hero. I'm sorry, Paige, but it, it doesn't work that way. The trumpet sounds off in the distance. Ah, that must be his majesty now. Reyna looks out the window. Everything is so predictable. I see my opportunity and lunge forward, putting my dagger into his back. It sinks in. My hand is warmed by his blood pouring over it. Did you predict that? <laughs> You'll never find her. <laughs> he sputters. You'll never find <coughs> justice. He collapses and leans over the windowsill. His arms are hanging into the courtyard. I step back and lean against the wall, panting. I look at the dagger and smile. Aaron hands me Reyna's dagger. How did you get this? I whisper. Every sound echoes in this dark chamber he keeps us in. He forgot it on his desk. When he left for the guild, I, I took it. If he finds it missing, he'll beat us again, or, or worse. I massage the recent bruise on my neck. Why did you take it? I look at the dagger strangely. I never held one before. It was cold and uncomfortable in my hand. So you can protect yourself when you escape. What? How? I look up at her. It is hard to make out her face in the dark. But I can still recognize it. It has changed so much in the four years we've been here. Her eyes are sunken and bruised. Her cheekbones protrude due to lack of food. A cut on her lip is still bleeding from yesterday. I wonder how much my face has changed. If it looks older, like hers. When he comes home, I will distract him long enough for you to run away. Aaron, that's insane. There must be another way. No. I've thought about this for a long time, and this is our best option. We must take advantage of this opportunity. But what about you? I, I can't leave you here. Aaron grabs my empty hand, holding it tight. You won't be leaving me if I tell you to go. She opens my hand and puts an angel necklace into it. Take this. Mother gave it to me before she passed. Now, I'm giving it to you. I, I, I couldn't take that from you. You must. She closes my hand around the wings. I can't keep it safe here. Raina could find it any day now. If you take this, you'll have Mother and me with you. You must keep Mother alive. I look down at her worn hand on mine. It is warm. And I try to remember this moment. She's right, like always. I have to escape and get help. Or at least keep one of us alive. I wouldn't leave her behind. I watched the angel swing from its chain in the open window. Reyna lay motionless. A soak in the moment I had dreamt about since he took us. I thought it would feel whole. Full, complete, but the pain hasn't left. Aaron's face flashes into my mind. She's still gone. I'd hoped to get more information from Reyna, but I'll 
have to work with what he gave me. Now I just need to escape. Oh my. I hear a voice from behind me. I turn to see a young man dressed in purple. It was the noble I saw earlier in the courtyard. He wears glasses and his hair is slicked back. You must be Paige. I was about to jump out the window, but then I stop. How do you know who I am? Oh, Raina told me all about you. He predicted that you would be showing up eventually. He looks at Raina. But maybe not so soon. I march over to him and put the dagger to his throat. If you tell anyone I was here, I will find you and give you the same treatment I did to him. He puts his hands in the air and allows the door to close behind him. Please, don't hurt me. There was no need to do anything like that. I, actually, I, I think we can work together. I tilt my head. What are you talking about? I keep the blade close to his skin. Well, uh, we could use your assistance. What? Yes, you see, uh, Brainer was our representative from the criminal sector. He informed me that you used to run the Assassin's Guild. We could use your experience, since the position has just been made available. You're offering me a job after I killed a council member? No, it doesn't have to be anything official. I, I can see how this could be strange, but it's honestly nothing new. The criminal representative is usually deposed of. Lots of dirty history, I suppose. We usually have to scramble for someone to fill the spot, and from what I've heard, you seem to at least have some form of moral compass, which is something to look for when considering partnerships. I stood there in shock. My dagger was still wet with Raina's blood, and I was being offered to replace him. Did he plan this? This is a trap that Raina set up? I press him against the map, forcing him to sit on the chest. No, it was, it was all my idea. I feel him tremble slightly. But he never breaks eye contact. Ever since he told me about your history, I've been considering the possibility. How do I know that I'll be safe? You could just arrest me as soon as I walk out these doors. Uh, we could, but your cooperation and information is far more valuable. Besides, we had someone like Raina and his record on the council. I'm sure you're not any worse than him. I thought about what he was saying. Working with the council. There would be a lot of power. I would have influence on the king and, and the lost past. I would have access to servants and horses. I would have intel from all over the kingdom and communication networks to neighboring regions. I felt the wings press against my clenching palm. I could use this to find Aaron. I could use this for good. Slowly take the dagger away from his throat. I'm still not completely sold yet. Understandable, he straightens up. I would be skeptical too, especially in your line of work. But would you at least be willing to open a line of communication? Communication. Hmm, it is a tempting offer. Can't think of anything wrong with just communicating. Besides, who am I afraid of? Reyna wouldn't be looking for me anymore. All right. I extend my hand. I think that will work. He shakes my hand. The angel necklace. Still inside. So that's the end of Angel of Death. This is kind of a backstory to the character of Angel from the story of you know, the original Night's Quest book club, uh, and kind of how she have got on the council, which is a tiny little blip in the first episode of book club, where it's like, oh, there's this woman in a red dress, and she's like working for the king, but she's also an assassin, what's going on? Um, so this was just kind of fleshing out her backstory, and, you know, we mentioned, oh, her sister was missing, so it connects some dots that I enjoy doing that character study of. Um, will that ever become relevant in the future rewrite of the book? Who knows? Um, but I hope you enjoyed that story. This next story isn't so much a story um, as it is a, like a section from a history book. So um, one, one thing I like to do with world building is to write out the history of the world, right? Um, and Glenwood is a place we spend a lot of time in. And so I wrote the history of the kings from its founding in the year 1911 to about the year 2500, which is around the time that the book of, you know, the original Book of Night's Quest takes place. Um, Song of the Hero takes place in, I think, 2041. 
So what I wanted to do was not read that whole thing because that's a lot of content and honestly would probably get boring and and would reveal some cards that I want to save for later because we might do a follow-up to Song of the Hero at some point. So I want to save the history for that. But we've dabbled enough in the history of Glenwood that I thought it would be beneficial to just kind of say it all out in one place um, from founding till uh, King Edward, which was the king uh, of Song of the Hero. So there's going to be a lot of name drops in here. There's going to be a lot of times and dates and places that we haven't referenced yet. So this may be boring to some of you. If you're someone who just wants pure, unadulterated lore, right? Quill Request is lore, but with a story, this one is just, just lore. It's just raw history book lore. Then this will be very interesting for you. Uh, if that's not something that's interesting for you, then there will be one more story after this and you can skip to that part. So this is the lineage of Glenwood royalty. I'll read the intro um, and then we'll get going. Glenwood is a strong and noble kingdom. Its history has lasted for over 600 years. By order of Her Majesty Queen Sarah, it has been decreed that this history be consolidated into one book so that future generations may learn from past mistakes and that great heroes may never be forgotten. This book will be categorized by monarchs. It will list the reason for the rise and fall of each, along with their accomplishments and crimes. O oh, Glenwood, do not be hasty when it comes to reading these pages, for this is who we are, and we cannot let time take that from us. Avion I, Father of the Family, 1911-1954 the history of the monarchs begins with the first king of Glenwood, Aphion I, the first founding king. To truly understand the power of Aphion, you must know the situation in which he lived. Aphion was born in 1885 in the New Troll Lands. Around this time, Panity was growing throughout the region. The human population loved it and saw it as a glimmer of hope, but their troll lords became increasingly oppressive. Aphion was 17 when the Cavan Revolution began. So it is no surprise that he was eager to join his classmates in destroying troll monuments and control stations. This started as a small rebellion and grew to become an organized war. Aphion was not the original leader of the humans' resistance, but was a part of the core group. After the Battle of Omaria in May of 1910, many members of the human resistance corps were killed, leaving Aphion to take charge. This book will not go into detail of the Geniad War, for that is well remembered elsewhere. Needless to say, the human resistance was victorious and drove out the troll lords. Aphion was chosen as the king of the Glenwood region at the age of 26. Now, Glenwood was not nearly as large as it is today. It was just a small region of the forest at the heart of the Geniad Peninsula, where the capital lies. Aphion saw a problem with how divided the land was. While most of these new regions were peaceful to each other, he knew they would never last long on their own. He thought of starting a federation like was done in the West, but none of the other kings were interested, partly because they were selfish and partly because of the Twenty Years' War. Aphion was disheartened and considered using force. However, in 1924, the regions of Cloverwood and Larkdale asked to join Glenwood. They were smaller regions and were not having much success. They saw the benefits of merging with a larger kingdom. Aphion welcomed them in eagerly because it was part of his dream of a united Geniad Peninsula, and they provided more access to the bubbling river. This greatly helped Glenwood to gain security in the new landscape. Oakden was the next region to join Glenwood in 1928. This gave Glenwood direct access to the mighty Fladelve River. Oakden was also a small region that was failing. Each of these three regions were allowed advisors on the king's council but they themselves had no power. Aphion used these new lands to grow the agricultural and industrial strength of Glenwood. However, there was more that Aphion wanted. Aphion was envious of the regions to his north, Darwood and Mopel. Each of them had resources he desired, primarily stronger timber. However, neither of these regions were likely to fail soon. Aphion knew that a militaristic attack would not be worth it, and none of his children were near age. This is because his children had all died in the war, and it wasn't until his fifth year as king that he got remarried and had a son, Melchior. This left him with few options. It was during this time that Timden begged to join Glenwood, in fear of being attacked by pools, 
during the Orc banishing of 1934 to 1935. One night in 1941, Avion had a dream that gave him the idea to challenge Mappel to a duel. He believed this dream was given to him by the writer. After talking with his council, he challenged the Mappel king to a sword fight. Winner gains the other kingdom. Aphion was victorious. A month later, he had another dream that he should wage another duel against Darwood. Again, he won, and grew the size of Glenwood. Aphion was able to add all this land to his kingdom without waging a single battle. He led each region fairly, sharing resources and creating centralized laws. It was also during this time that he changed the name of the capital from Leontari to Crown's Heart to reflect its new significance as the center of a kingdom. Overall, he was a good king that led fairly and justly. After 43 years, he died peacefully and was succeeded by his son. Melchior I, Builder of a Nation, 1954-1977 Melchior I, eldest son of Aphion I, became king at the age of 37. He is known as the second founding king. Unlike his father, Melchior did not focus on growth in land size, but on infrastructure. He built roads and bridges to unite the regions. He constructed granaries and watermills. He added many improvements that kept Glenwood strong agriculturally. While Melchior never used the military, he did build strong defenses. He built good walls around the capital and garrisons at strategic locations. Some of Melchior's most notable constructions are the Waterpath Bridge, the Cloverwood Fortress in Dinistan, the Larkdale Harbor in Chippingdale, and the first real Glenwood Castle. Other points of interest about his reign was that he was the one who chose gold to be Glenwood's crest color. He also instituted the Beget Behead Bestow Law in 1971. This law would guide the future of Glenwood royalty successions. He got the idea from a traitor from the Brodrings of old. While Avion is known as the father of the family, being the one who created Glenwood, Melchior is credited as being the one who really solidified Glenwood's stability as a kingdom. His innovations provided security and showed the benefits of Avion's original plan to unite the peninsula. He paved the way, literally and figuratively, for his descendants. He reigned for 23 years and died peacefully. Rowald, the Unifier, 1977-1993 Rowald, the eldest son of Melchior I, became king at age 36. He is known as the third founding king. During his father's reign, he saw the disunity that was still plaguing the Gennead region. He admired his grandfather's vision of unification, and he spent his life trying to bring the dream to reality. This all started with his first marriage to Wendy of Aberdale in 1968. After Wendy's father died in 1979, Rewald brought Aberdale into the Glenwood Kingdom. This addition greatly increased trade with direct access to the Eastern Sea. This union aggravated Achad, who had been trying to take the region for years. This started the Achadian War in 1980. This war lasted for two years. At first the war was almost at a standstill, but Rewald was able to push Achad back because of their superior amount of resources. Rawald spent a year rebuilding war-torn regions and connecting Aberdale and the Chad to Crown's Heart. Once things seemed to be in order, he continued his expansion south. Taking Goodshire was not difficult. They did not have a strong defense. So in 1983, Rawald marched his army to their border and demanded that a trade be made. He was able to buy the land by promising the king a spot on his council, as all region leaders did, and giving his daughter in marriage to one of his sons. There was also an exchange of gold and materials, but no one is sure as to the precise amount that was bartered. This trade is known as the Golden Deal. This only left the region of Kazgais. They were a strong group militarily and economically. A trade or war would be very costly. Rewald spent 1984 thinking how he would grow his kingdom. That year, while he thought, his wife Wendy got sick and died within the month. Rewald was heartbroken and lamented for months. Eventually, he turned to prostitutes and having as many women as he could. According to Fable, there was one point in which Rewald had over 200 women in his castle. Rewald remained like this for a few years. This time period also resulted in many illegitimate children being born. Then, in 1986, he was visited by the Glenwood Redran. He told Rewald to take control of his life and to finish his dream of uniting the Gennead region. Rewald then saw an opportunity. The king of Cosgeis had just died, leaving his wife, 
with no children of age and no husband. Rod quickly set out and married her, adding Cosgeist to Glenwood. He spent his remaining years as king ruling wisely and bringing order to Glenwood. To the people, he was viewed as a good king, and many of his romantic exploits are forgotten. He died after ruling Glenwood for 16 years at the age of 52. He died from the same disease that took his first wife, Wendy. His death marked the end of the founding king's reign, a golden time for Glenwood. What would follow would be a time not so prosperous. Gentian, the Double Fool, 1993 to 1997. Gentian, eldest son of Wendy and Rewald, became king at the age of 24. He is not remembered for his successes. Rather, his two mistakes. The first mistake took place in December of 1995. The War of Religious Blood had begun in October. A battle of East Cordia versus Cavan over a theological disagreement. When the war began, Cavan was in shock and called for aid. Gentian was eager to join the war and help Cavan. However, no one in the King's Council recommended joining the war. Glenwood was finally in a time of unified peace and needed to focus on domestic issues. Fighting this war would gain nothing for Glenwood. Besides, while Cavan was initially faring poorly, the council knew that Cavan would be victorious in the end. Yet, even with all this wisdom, Gentian made his own decision. He promised Cavan that he would send the Glenwyn army to their aid. This was his first mistake. The army was sent to Cavan in February of 1996. Gentian stayed behind in Crown's heart and did not go to the fighting. By this point, his council was telling him that since they were joining the fight, Gentian must give it his all. He must show that there is weight behind a Glenwood promise and strength in their soldiers. He must fight until the war is over. Gentian agreed at first, but it wasn't long until he made his second mistake. In May of 1996, the Cavan and Glenwood armies took a defeat at Cormoria. It was nothing great, but it was the first major defeat they had faced. When this news reached Gentian, he was filled with fear. He immediately called for a retreat of Glenwood soldiers. His council advised against this, telling him that victory was soon and retreat would do more damage than good. He ignored them a second time. This choice had disastrous consequences. First, it shattered the relationship between Glenwood and Cavan. Cavan felt betrayed and was forced to rethink their strategy and fight alone. Second, it told all other kingdoms that Glenwood could not be trusted. Once the promise was broken, it ruined any hope of new promises being made. Finally, it broke the spirit of the people. They had just been rallied for this war, and now their army was running in fear. This dropped Gentian's popularity severely, so much so that in the summer of 1997, he was assassinated by his half-brother, Gauthier. Gauthier of Coasterine, 1997 to 2009. Gauthier, son of the Cosgeis Queen, was 25 when he killed Gentian. He had no Aphionic blood, but because he was son of Rawald, most people did not revolt against him. Because he was born and raised in Coasterine, he spent most of his time there. He didn't make it the new capital officially, but it was functionally. The King's Council met there. Royal festivals were created there, and the King had his many wives stay there. To house himself and his family, he refurbished the Saltstone Manor in 2001. For most of Glenwood, he is not known as a good king. He neglected most of the country, sending little aid to struggling villages. For example, when the Timden region was assaulted by raiders from Pools, he only sent one horseman with a sack of bread. Some records say that he even raised taxes and production output on northern regions to supply Cosgeist. However, for those living in Cosgeist, he was a hero. He repaired the walls of Coasterine, he had lumber from Darwood and Mappel brought to construct the ship's highway, the docks of Coasterine. He also gave gifts to the farmers of Cosgeist to help them advance. In 1991, Gauthier took a local annual tradition and turned it into an official holiday. This was when the Sun Festival was created. There are many fables of his heroic deeds and adventures told by Coaster Knights. He also claimed to be a descendant of the Salt Father, the first lord of Coasterine. However, there is little to no historical evidence to back this up. In 2007, he also established West Cosgeist in the land that used to be Wastes, as its own region in Glenwood. This was partly because Cosgeist was too large to be sustainable, and partly because he had a lord he promised power to. This is where the city of Goldon can be found. Gauthier was also very similar to his stepfather, in the fact that he enjoyed the company of women. 
However, unlike Rowald, he didn't stop. As soon as he turned 18, he got married and had his first son, Gristle. From there, he got married three more times in the span of his life, only breaking off one marriage, and that was because she died. This resulted in Gauthier having many children, 13 in total. He also had many illegitimate children. There is no record of how many of these there were. Later sources estimate around 20. These children could have been seen as a threat, but Gauthier was smart in, his, in this way. He used his daughters to reforge the relationship with Cavan. He married all five of them to Cavanian lords, princes, and nobles. He also began trade deals with Cavan from Costarine. In short, Gauthier was king of Costarine and favored Cavan over the rest of his kingdom. In 2009, he drowned when he fell off the docks while wearing armor during a storm. Gristle, the Forgotten, 2009. Gristle was 19 when he became king. He was the eldest son of Gauthier, so the rightful heir to the throne. However, no one wanted him to be king. He was not smart, good in combat, or sport. He was not attractive, nor did he have any remarkable skill. Little is recorded about him. The most notable quote was from his brother saying, You could walk into a room with him, and you wouldn't even notice that he was there until he spoke, which could be hours. A shadow had more presence. After only being king for three months, he was killed by his younger brother, Wank. Wank the Favored, 2009-2016 Wank was 14 when he killed his brother. He was the fourth eldest child of Gauthier and the third eldest of the first marriage. He was loved by the people and by his father. He had a natural charm and was talented in sports. He would compete in the Sun Festival Games and won almost every year. Even though he was young, people looked up to him and believed him to be their next king. After taking the throne, he knew what he had to do to secure it. He had all his siblings executed. He even had a purge sent out to find all illegitimate children of his father. This was initially met with shock, but as very few people were influenced by it, there was little resistance. During his seven years as king, Wank continued the Cavanian relationship, having spared his sisters from the purge. He was not a great king, but he kept the kingdom afloat. He spent most of his time dealing with the Poolish, who are constantly antagonizing Glenwood. However, he never goes on the offense, remaining purely on the defense. Little did he know that beyond the border was his only weakness. In 2016, Wink was assassinated by his half-brother, Edward. Edward I, the Cuthroat, 2016 to... I'm not going to tell you. Edward was 14 when he became king. He was the seventh son of Gauthier and youngest child. He was the only child of Gauthier's fourth marriage. He was only two when his father died in the water. To protect him, his mother fled to Pools. At the time, Pools had been provoking Glenwood, but large conflicts had yet to break out. She raised him there as Wank ruled. Edward made connections to the Poolish king, Levain. Levain took Edward almost as his own son, but it was secret. He taught him how to be authoritative and not to trust anyone. Using his help, Edward orchestrates an assassination of his half-brother. During the Sun Festival, Wank was watching the joust, when a mysterious knight arrives challenging the king to a match. Wank accepts, loving the sport. Wank wins easily and is thrilled. The figure offers the king a drink and he accepts. The figure then challenges him to a match of stone toss. Wank wins easily again. Another drink is offered and he drinks it. Finally, the figure challenges the king to a duel. The king accepts and is held on the last day of the festival. During the duel, the figure puts up a fist, but is overcome by the clearly older king. The figure surrenders and offers the king a final drink. The king takes it in victory. After drinking it, he chokes and falls to the ground. He had been poisoned and died. The mysterious figure reveals himself to be Edward, the lost son of Gauthier. He is immediately crowned as king. During his reign, Edward was a cruel king. He increased the taxes and production costs of the people. He made Costarine the capital and built statues to honor himself. Edward hired a few brilliant outcasts to use their magic in the land. These men were called the Burn Shards. This was because they had broken off of a brilliant group and used fire as a primary magic source. Each member had a burned part of their body. Of course, this required high costs from the people in animals, wealth, materials, and a few humans, but that is speculatory. He is most known for backstabbing those who helped him. First, he killed all his half-sisters in Cavan in 2021. 
using his magicians to help. Each sister was killed using fire. This greatly weakened the relationship with Kavan, revealing again that the Glenwood promise has little merit. The only reasons this event didn't lead to war was because the Cavanian king had other priorities. Next, he betrayed Thridley. Thridley was fighting Dunmas, who were being aided by the Watergrove. In 2027, Thridley requested that Glenwood either send aid or take over Watergrove. After agreeing to send help, the Thridleans awaited the gift. After a few months, a gift came. But it was not what they wanted. It was a cart full of rotten fish. He did this to show that Glenwood was not in the business of helping others. The biggest betrayal of all was toward Pools. The Pools King, Levain, had expected compensation for his help. Edward promised him wealth, power, and maybe even a seat on the king's council. The wealth was brought, and some of Levain's policies were passed. But when Levain reminded Edward in 2029 that he was promised a seat at the council, Edward slit his throat. He didn't want to be in debt to anyone. The remaining years of his reign are categorized by Edward leaving his, the kingdom to be run primarily by the council, having little say in the day-to-day. -day. However, he kept the taxes high, and he never officially declared war on pools, even though conflicts rose, and to the people, it seemed like they were at war. Occasionally, when drunk, he would run through the countryside with the burned shards causing mischief. These were called his fire runs. How he died? I'm not going to tell you because that might become relevant in the story. So that's where we're going to leave off on the lineage of the Kings of Glenwood. Uh, again, there's a lot. There's a lot of stuff I wrote there. That was like a week of just feverish writing of me figuring out this whole timeline and son of who and how it led to things in uniting the kingdom. A couple things with Edward. I mentioned that he made the coast ring the capital. But I know that in a Quilber quest, we said that it was Galthier who made Coastering the Capital. I'm not sure which I prefer as a creator. I think we'll leave it as uh, both. Doesn't matter. Probably, I don't know. I'm going to decide. What do you guys think? What's better? Um, and then I also wrote down that gift of a cart of rotten fish that was given to the other country, Thridley. Bismarck's question mark? Could have been. Maybe. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I realized as I read that there were a lot of name drops and people and places and things that we have never, ever explained ever. So if you have questions about them, you can leave a comment on the Patreon post or in the Discord, and I might answer them depending upon what the question is. Because some of them might be like, oh yeah, I can tell you what that country is or what that word is. Some of them might be, mm, I'm saving that for later. So that is the... Yeah, Lineage of the Kings, and I hope as you listen to that, you notice stories from previous Patreon episodes or Song of the Hero stuff. They've all been kind of woven f into that or from that story, from that story primarily. So, yeah. Our final story of this story time with Nathan is going to be the most spoiler-heavy one yet. Uh, so here's what it spoils. It spoils the ending of Song of the Hero. So if you've already listened to it, Great, you're going to love this, you're going to enjoy it. If you have not listened to the end of Song of the Hero, uh, and you're wanting to, then I'm going to have to say this is the end of the episode for you, because this is a big one. This is a big one. Okay, so if you're not wanting to have that spoiled, uh, you're going to have to leave at this portion right now. So goodbye, thanks for listening, glad you joined us for story time. And now for everybody else, the spoilers are coming in now. So at the end of Song of the Hero, we had a special guest... Uh, my fiancé at the time, and my now wife, Lauren, voiced the character of the lover. And since recording that, she also, liking to write, uh, wrote a little short story um, about the lover's perspective after the events in the finale episode. And I read it, and I liked it so much, and I'm like, I want this to be canon. So I got her to actually read out that story. So here is the lover, short story. Uh, written by Lauren and voiced by Lauren. I am floating. I can feel everything and nothing at the same time. Soft flits of pink and white swish past me, pulsing in and out, in and out. Who were they? What did they feel, do in their short time here? I will never know everything, but I care. I softly guide them to my arms until we become one and they go where they need to go again. They tell me soft stories of the world. 
The world I initially created but is foreign to me now. A world full of discourse, a world full of violence or pain. It was not one I recognized. Where did it go, the world I created? The love I created? Was it trapped in here with me? Before I can even answer, they are gone. One with me until they go where they need to go. Anima, magic, love pulsing in and out, in and out. A slow heartbeat of love. This is all I can do. It is all I can do in here, trapped in the hues of pink and the bounces of light and what remains of those who enter. Then I am alone. Alone as he left me. Alone as that blurry moment. The moment where I know the facts. I just don't remember the feelings. Did you cry for me, my love? Did you even grieve? The moment I was struck down, I couldn't even see you. I just saw the eyes of someone who was angry, hurting. Someone who wanted their way in a fruitless war for power. Then I saw nothing until I awoke here in my prison of light and hues. Do you even think of me? Am I even a thought? Or have I also become a pawn in this wicked game you're playing? A game that started out innocent but has become a path of destruction. Do you even think of love? Can you even hear me? See me? Why haven't you tried to see me? Do you no longer love me? Have you found a way to live without the other half of you? Why do I still love you? When someone other than a lost soul entered for the first time in... I don't know how long. I was excited, afraid, confused, all at the same time. This one felt different. They were not coming in for me, but to consume me. I moved to the side, afraid to touch or be seen by who I now recognized as the spirit of chaos. He seeped in like a dark purple ooze, but oddly enough, I wasn't angry. Despite him being a possible threat, I was just content to not be alone. To know someone wasn't fleeting. His presence was a raging melody of lack of control, of wanting more than what he was. I felt sorry for him. I understood his feeling of wanting to be free. More entered. Now a chorus of hushed and concerned whispers filled my void. I was there. I was present. And I was listening. They were worried. Concerned about the chaos spirit in my prison, concerned for the world, but I was more concerned for him. Did they not hear his shouts of agony that my love had inflicted upon him? While I did remember his betrayals in the war now, I still believed in second chances, and making a loving decision. I challenged them. I challenged them to go against what my love, what my other broken half was putting in their heads. I love him. I love him more than my own life, but in love there is justice. In love there is honesty. In love one needed to be put in their place when the need arose. They thought of freeing me, but I knew at that moment it was not time. I was not complete yet. I was living, thinking, but without a face. How can I go to be love when I did not have a face to show for it? Plus, I was hesitant. If my love wanted to see me, free me, he would do it himself. He would come find me. Despite the disagreement in choices, I still trusted him. Then they were gone. I was alone again. The cracks in my prison closed up. I was conflicted, regretting my silence in the matter of me leaving, but proud of my loyalty to my other half. So I will wait. I'll wait until you love me again because I will never stop loving you. All right, that is the end of our story time with Nathan. Uh, thank you so much again for, for listening. I hope you enjoyed those little stories behind the world. Let us know if you want more. Let me know which ones were your favorites, you know, the poems, the longer stories, the shorter ones, whatever. And uh, then I'll know to maybe write more of those because I've kind of, I've got a lot of other things written, but not all of them are like, in story format so i do want to write more of them and if i know i can use them again later on for the podcast uh that'll encourage me to do it more so let me know which ones you like the most and i'll write more of those styles of, of stories because there is lots more to see in the world of Palladium 
and I hope we get to explore it in the main show as well. But this is just a lot easier to dip into those quick things. Also, uh, after going back and, and editing the part where I read the lineage of the royalty of Glenwood, I thought it might be helpful to include some maps. So on the Patreon post, uh, I have included some pictures of the maps during that time period. So at least some of the names and places will make sense. So uh, feel free to check those out. Those are for you to see, my lovely patrons. Again, thank you so much for your support. Patrons, we love you guys, and we'll see you in the next one.